back. Thank you. It's good this to be back. <laughs> <laughs> this is supposedly the second part of our interview because like we have lost the first part. Dude, that can be a lost episode. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it got lost in the archives now. So we are doing this. And there's no blaming game, right? <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> okay. But like, uh, it's, I don't know. Okay. I, uh, I think... It's it's a good segue to <laughs> to our first topic for today <laughs> about like what to do when things don't get by your yeah. way and like especially when you put in the effort and you plan everything and you do the thing and at the last mi- second and like at the last small footsteps everything gets ruined. So what should people do about that? I would say I'm not the expert on this. Okay. So, but one thing it always that is always useful is to take a step back Mm -hmm. and you obviously have to feel your feelings like if you are going to be frustrated you need to feel the frustration if you're going to feel panicked then you should feel panicked then you should let those emotions um you know take over however after that you need to have a moment of reflection and see what is the way forward so what is it that we can do to either amend this or restart this so Mm -hmm. having that moment of reflection is important to see how we can move forward but i think we sometimes discount the initial reaction which is panic and i think that is a very valid feeling to feel right um so you have to allow yourself to feel that again no expert but that's what i would would yeah i would like i would also agree with that because like if if you get to in a stage or like in a way of acting where like you keep like you keep pushing these feelings down and yeah. like you you keep suppressing them just to to get things done let's say you would reach a point i think where like it's gonna blow out eventually yeah. and like you can't keep hiding the dust under the carpet for so long and it's gonna, it's gonna come up, yeah, yeah it's gonna come out and yeah. like maybe the smallest uh, non inconvenience that happens to you like you're gonna have like a meltdown or like a burst out or something like that. So I think that's a really good way to look at it, especially for students, because like we we keep a lot of deadlines and like assignments to yeah. the last minute. Yeah. And sometimes like the internet goes off or like stuff like that happens. So uh, we 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 must learn how to deal with that frustration. And it's also really you know sad for students because the internet is never on their side yeah sometimes somehow the law of u- the universe is that during the submission time yeah is exactly when things go wrong I <laughs> there's some <laughs> phenomena there right i see the phenomena yeah. and like it's true sometimes <laughs> but uh, yeah i mean like once like i had a, a submission that i had to make and like everything was on track and then like an hour before the recording like something also like yeah. a bug or something and like a no it, it really does happen yeah. I'm, I'm being half um sarcastic because okay, yeah. it is the energy that you put forward sometimes even when you're looking for something that is lost yeah. when you look for it and you're so frazzled and like you're so kind of um confused yeah you have a much harder time finding it because it might come to you but you won't see it because in that moment you feel like you're just so confused yeah so it's always good to come come down with a the yeah. calm energy yes. and i yeah. think also like another part of it like the internet thing especially when when we were going through covid for for example like we we were like highly dependent on that where all, now it's a bit better because yeah. like you can see the instructors like talk to them uh, before like the submission but like back then it was only through the internet and like that also added more to the frustration i think I can imagine. Yeah. So moving to our next topic for today, I want to also talk about like assessing students. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, because like for me, when it comes like on my end, like as a student, uh, like the grade is, it's like, it's not only like the representation of how good you did on that assignment. It's also like something that's motivating. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, like if you get a good grade on like, uh, on a class or like on an assignment that you've done you gonna say that okay since now I'm on the right track yeah I'm gonna keep trying to get those where like if you had like a bad exam or like a bad assignment it's usually like you're gonna t- try to get like a D or pass yeah. but like once you pass that very like 
good grades like A, B, C, like it's gonna be more difficult to keep you motivated to go through the extra mile and like try to provide the same as mm. uh, like for that assignment. So how would you address it like as an instructor? So the way I design my assessments in my classes is that no particular aspect of the division of the types of assessment will have a lot of void. So you will, there'll be a lot of opportunities for the students to be able to either lose points and also gain points. Okay. So that just an individual circumstance does not really have a strong overall impact on the overall performance. Okay. So the way that would be is, for example, I have a lot of daily quizzes, I have a lot of daily assignments, I have a lot of um, I have presentation, I have in-class engagement, I have seven response papers, only a few of them will be counted, I drop mm. some quizzes, I um, there's a final paper, and the final paper has some weight more so than the others. However, I feel pretty confident by then that the students are able to, do some, to do some good work and, yeah. you know, um, be able to challenge themselves and overcome the pressure. So the way I look at assessment is it's an ongoing it's ongoing yeah. throughout the semester and it's not that if a student misses one that that will that is going to affect their overall performance. No, it's very much um, a holistic approach mm. to it. Um, and even I do I think it's different for me because I teach writing and writing in of itself is a process. But I can say that this would probably very, be very useful in any of the technical um, classes as well. Yeah. Just smaller, discrete points where students can achieve um, just daily motivation. And it's also keeping students on track. Yeah. So I have said this in my classes as well. I really don't like giving quizzes. Um, it's a pain for me to grade. I don't think really it's an assessment of your knowledge. Yeah. But the only way I can really make sure that, that you read it and you don't just read summaries is for me to do quizzes. Yeah. And so that's why I do them. And I do them very consistently and it really does keep students on track. I can't say everybody does, the, do, everybody does not do the reading, but majority of the students do, which means that we end up having a good class um, discussion. So for me, it goes back to it's an ongoing process and it needs to reflect that in the assessments as well. Yeah, you talked about like having many assessments to do with the students and like I think that's probably the best way to go about this because like I had classes where like uh, we only had like two midterms and a final and like one major assignments. Yeah. So like it was pretty chunky for like every submission that you had like it was like yeah. a, a large percentage of your grade depends on it. And like sometimes you get like you, when you talk to the instructor, you would see that they are taking like a triple overload or like they are taking so many yeah. classes. So they cannot keep up with like having many assessments to keep grading the students on. So how do you think like this can be? Because like you apparently like you have figured a way to keep the students focused and like consistent throughout the semester. But like if for st instructors who cannot do that? I wouldn't say I've figured out a way. Okay. Yeah, because I think it changes depending on what type of students I have. Mm. Some students I can help, some students I really can't. You know, yeah. it's, it just depends on um, the type of student that, that I deal with. Yeah. But just from my experience teaching and studying teaching, um, a consistent assessment really works and it doesn't need to be that much extra work for the instructor. So what that means is very um, quick checks. So I do a lot of in-class assignments and that just requires you to do it. Mm. So it just keeps you on track. It doesn't really, there's no numerical value on it. It's like you do it, you get the grade. So this types, these types of assessment incentivizes students and it's also much less work for the instructor. Yeah. Um, and sometimes you can even, I know some people have um, different thoughts about this, but you can even ask students to assess each other. Not every assessment needs to be by the instructor. Would that work? It does work when you don't give it a numerical value again, mm, okay. when you give feedback. So you ask the students, so you do this. So it's not a grade, it's just like your opinion about Yeah, this. you give a feedback and then what you do is, as the instructor, you go over it to see if the feedback is valid, valid yeah. and then you can give that to the student. So there are a lot of ways you can work around it. Um, obviously, testing for some of the disciplines is the most straightforward way to test knowledge. 
Um, however, in my experience, testing is not my preferred method of assessment because yeah. I think there's a lot of student work that goes un, unaccounted for when during you just tests. do, yeah, mm. during tests. Um, for me, that on- ongoing um, assessment method just keeps students, even if they lose track, they can always come back on track because each individual assessment is not that, that chunky. T- yeah. 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 So like you can get around like a few wrong ones and like you can yeah. still be motivated. To and towards the, the end, because I have so much to pick from, I typically choose the best ones that I have. So if mm. I have like, let's say 15 quizzes, I drop like five quizzes and I just t- choose the 10 best ones. And mm. you have opportunity to miss five quizzes. That's yeah. a lot, you know. So it, I just have a lot, a larger number to work with in the end to help you kind of give you a grade that is more fairly lo- reflective of your learning. Yeah, and like even for us, like we even though that we hate these weekly quizzes and checking and everything, but like when you come to the midterm or like the final submission, you would see that you have reviewed like a pretty large aspect of like the materials that are involved in that. So it is pretty helpful. Like we, like for last week, I think we had a quiz and like didn't make sense. It was the last week of classes. So like, why, why did we have the class? But like when, when the final exams material was like uh, revealed like most of it was in that quiz that we just like reviewed last week so even though that we hated it back then but right now we can like okay let's study something else since like most of the final would be on that quiz so yeah it's it's a pretty like multi-dimensional issue that like it's most the instructors struggle with as i said because like you might have a lot of classes and like yeah. you might have a lot of students that you need to cover and material and everything but for the students as well because like assignments can be pretty <laughs> terrifying when yeah. they have like large amounts f- for their fi- like how they count toward the final grade Definitely. So moving forward, you are teaching this semester the public speaking class. Mm-hmm. Uh, based on my view, I think that like a good speech has two elements to it, which are like having the right preparation and what you are going to talk about, and also having the it factor, the yeah. confidence, how you convey the message and everything. So how would you... What's your intake on that? How would you sum up a good speech? I think so. There are a lot of different types of speeches and each speech has its own purpose. So we did the semester we did to inform, to persuade, to entertain. Mm. Um, and I think another one that I can't remember right now. It's okay. Um, but so each speech has its own purpose and that is obviously then that needs to be adapted to Mm. the type of audience that you have and the type of occasion that it is so I think a speech that is successful is one that keeps the audience engaged and states a very clear purpose um, and the audience is, is aware of that purpose and where the speaker is not speaking to they're not doing it in in from a very personal perspective, they're doing it t- to convey or give us a message to understand. Mm. So they're not thinking so much about what am I going to say? What am I going to say? It's more like I have this thing to say and I want to say it in this way to you. So it's more like an act of service that you're doing. Yeah. And I think throughout the semester, I myself am not a very extroverted person. So I was... I felt so empathetic towards the students who were by like myself, yeah. not very, you know, outgoing. So I think I was overly sympathetic. Um, in the future, I'd be a bit more strict on those things. But obviously, body language really matters. Your tone, your delivery matters. Um, but I think overall, it is the content. Is your content adaptive to the occasion? Is it adaptive to the audience? And if it is, then you're going to be pretty good to go. Yeah, so you yeah. talked about like students who are not very comfortable like giving a public speech or like speaking to a large yeah. uh, number of of people. So how you would like encourage them besides like preparing all the right content and the material? How was that 
something that can be taught. So what we did this semester was we did a lot of improv and impromptu activities for the students. So what that means is, um, I think it was the second week. Okay. I think it was the second week, yeah. Um, I brought a an envelope to the students and they had to choose a paper from that envelope and mm. that was the topic that they had to talk about for three minutes. Mm. And it was topics like neuroplasticity, neocolonialism. Um, it was just topics that they had never heard of. Yeah. And they just, and I said, you cannot sit down. You have to stand there for three minutes. You either have to say something or you have to look at them just, yeah. you know, silently. And it was... A f- an interesting class obviously the students were so nervous um, yeah. it was their first time to give like a serious speech on a topic that they had never um, really about, prepared yeah. about yeah. you know prepared for and they had to, they had to be there for three minutes and it went as you would expect <laughs> right Terribly, huh? yeah because a lot of the people didn't even know what the words meant yeah. right and the next class what they had to do was to, was to prepare So it's the same word, three minutes, but you have to prepare. Mm. But one thing, the point of that exercise was, and I wanted to do it in the very beginning of the semester, is because it's very rare that you're going to be given a topic that you know nothing about, absolutely nothing about, Mm. and that you're going to be so unprepared for. Typically, when you're asked to speak, you are going to be you are going to be expected to know some of these things, right? So this is going to be the kind of like extreme exposure therapy yeah. type of speech. And the second class that they came back, they all had really great speeches, three minutes about these topics. So it also showed us the importance of preparation and knowing what is important and what is not important. Mm. So that is one way that the students who, you know, it's trying to be... Um, adaptive to the environment yes. right so that's one of the ways that we did that and we had so many different exercises impromptu speeches things that they had to sell um a lot of that so that in the preparation aspect of it was that they do that at home but in class we're doing a lot of things that is going to reduce our anxiety that's going to prepare us for different situations yeah yeah so uh, it goes exactly like what we said like first it's it's most two parts like yeah. the content and like how you would deliver it and like for the uh, improv speech that you talked about like it's it's pretty good to see how people would what would they do in these scenarios where like they don't know what they're talking about yeah. basically so they are giving <clears throat> a subject and like they have to rely solely on what to deliver so it's it's re- really interesting to see and like have you noticed how like students improve when it comes to how they would deliver their content throughout the semester definitely i've seen a lot of improvement i think the students are now much more aware yeah um in their role as audience members so when they give a speech they understand what is engaging and what is not engaging um they understand that they need to have a clear purpose yeah. and the delivery of that purpose is equally important and you can deliver that in various ways but one of the really good ways is humor you know incorporating humor into your speech is very important obviously when appropriate but um i so today was the final assessment for public speaking class yeah um and everybody has improved so incredibly much since the first day of class and everybody has improved in their own way none of them have completely changed and become these you know Great of course, orators, like, yeah, of course, yeah. because to me it's very important that you still maintain your personality and mm. authenticity. And they have all just improved so incredibly much. I'm very proud of them. That's amazing yeah. to hear. And like you also had like the open mic event. Yeah, that was yeah. really fun. Did you, were you there? Yes. Yeah. Did you? S- no, no, you I didn't. didn't. Why not? I didn't have anything to say. <laughs> okay, you didn't have a poem to <laughs> yeah. read. So, but like that was also like interesting to see like how with students like we don't have these kind of events frequently yeah here. so it's it's nice to see like what would like it wasn't only students like there were only like foreigners yeah uh, like, it's very diverse yeah it was a diverse group of individuals who performed in that and it's really nice to see like how like regular people would uh, give on these like how would they deliver poems or like how would they uh, go about giving like comedy s- s- 
sketch yeah. or something like this. So it yeah. was really interesting to to see how like people that you know and like you are familiar yeah. with would uh, try to fit in that uh, scenario and like that situation. And it was it was a really good event to to go through. Uh, nextly, I want to talk about like passion and mm-hmm. like how one would and this like hectic and crazy time would find their passion and hand, uh, how would they go about it to turn it either to a way of living or like something on the side so what's your take on that as well mm. um passion do you mean passion as in like your one true passion or do you mean hobbies i don't know okay yeah because, because <laughs> it's like you, you're asking this <laughs> yeah <laughs> the I mean, personal yeah the personal because passion. like uh, we don't know like these kind of things like yeah. it's it's something that's not told by us most of the time by yeah. our parents it's like what we hear or like what we see in movies or like online it's this new thing that you are hit with when you are yeah. around puberty and yeah. like you you start to like find your thing find your passion and like either turns it to a living or like keep doing it because like yeah. it motivates you personally so i don't know what's what's your intake on that so i have no sp- i don't have a sp- particular viewpoint on it however i think there's a lot of pressure to put on young people to find their passion yeah. i think passion is something that is ever changing it doesn't need to be one thing throughout there are yeah. people who are lucky who have a interest from birth and that's yeah. just what they keep at it but that's not really um applicable for it's most not applicable yeah, yeah it's not applicable for, for most people and the things i liked when i was five is different than to 10 to mm. then 15 to then 20 to then now 30 yeah Shh, don't say that um so it yeah. just changes and i think it's a lot of pressure to put on people to say you have to find one your one true passion yeah um interests hobbies it's all about exploring it's about you like this you did it it was fun you did this you did not like it you don't need to do it again Mm. it's about doing things we learn so much from doing things and not enjoying them as well because that's kind of like a process of elimination as well Mm. so i think it's about exploring it's about opening up yourself to the opportunities that come to you come your way even if it seems like it's not something that seems relevant to the field that you're studying but it seems interesting to you just on a personal level just take those, you know, opportunities, um, explore, see what's out there. But again, unless you are some very fortunate person who was born a great violinist and will continue to like become whatever, yeah, it's really unachievable or yeah, it's very unachievable to put that type of pressure on someone. Yeah, I agree. And like it's it's adding to all the things that you are expected to do yeah. by like some certain ages and like uh, as you get older like you you are expected to tame down a bit on like your passions and yeah. like your hobbies and like focus more on your career which is like also something that's as i said like expectations yeah. by society and like this kind of stuff so it is like an ongoing battle i think between like finding the things that you enjoy and like finding what you are good at and like how you can i don't know just keep enjoying them yeah. or like try to turn them into something and you don't also need to i think we have this misconception again that we have to do something we love mm. and it will never be work and that's not true even if you do something that you love it it will at some point become work because yes. it is work mm. um and you can even just have something that you do as a profession, but you do your passion on the side. Yeah. That's also very acceptable. They don't need to always coincide. And I don't want to get into this whole like capitalistic theory thing, but yeah. it is really fed to us in a way so that we associate ourselves and our identity with our work so that mm-hmm. we can become producers of yeah. the economy, you know? And um, it's just another way for us to kind of be part of that system but you can be separate you can just exist without having to have any of these passions you can just be someone who's interested and interesting and mm. so it's not necessary to that's what i think mm. but uh, what do i know <laughs> right i mean like <laughs> <laughs> so yeah i mean that's what i think because i like yourself when i was especially younger and i just graduated i was like i have to find my passion i have to find my passion it's also like 
I was passionate about something then that I'm not now and now I'm like it's just changes you know mm. and that's just the reality you know do I you see. want to do you want to mix your profession I mean, and your interest y- I don't know because like uh, I'm doing this yeah. currently on the side and like let's see <clears throat> how it goes but like as you said like you uh, you need exposure you need to to get into these like different things and like different scenarios and like uh, go and like uh, monk mode and like just yeah. isolate yourself for a while and then like go go out uh, seven times a day yeah. and see like what's 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 you what what did you enjoy more what did you feel the best at because like i think you need to keep a good balance like that's that's my intake on it for now yeah. it's to find the things that you enjoy and hopefully keep a good balance between what's important what do you enjoy what you should do and yeah it's as you said like it's like even the things that you are enjoying and you love doing and your passion is about like once you keep doing them for a while like you start questioning like why i'm doing this yeah. like whether it's going to the gym exercising like your side projects uh, or even the things that you like you should do like studying or like these kinds of things uh, it's like i don't think realistically speaking you are going to be excited about doing something every time you are doing it yeah on top of technical issues <laughs> and like human error a lot of issues to deal <laughs> with so we're talking about passion yes yeah and like uh, we're discussing like how uh, even the things that you would enjoy like after a while like it's going to become normal and you're going to get used to it and it's going to get not as you we will not get the same reward from it after a while that's why it's good to keep experimenting with stuff to yeah to get a fresh perspective. Definitely, yeah, yeah. I agree with that. So, uh, you published one of your articles about <coughs> about like reflections on war. So, how do you think that war has affected us like as a country? Because like we have been in so many by now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, that um so the ac- the actual title is Reflections Away from War. Mm-hmm. Because Okay, yeah. Um I did it for a class at the time. I was taking a poetry class, mm-hmm. and at that exact time was when ISIS uh, was taking over Mosul, mm-hmm. and it just felt very real. But in a way, I also didn't because I was going to university. Everything was still normal. I was living day to day life. But then I had students, classmates who whose families had to relocate and were displaced. So it felt very close, but yet very far away. Mm-hmm. And that's what inspired that um, that prose poem. But generally, as you can see, the war has affected the country at various times and in various regions. Mm. And the effects we can see now, even systemically, personally, collectively, it's it's um, the presence and its impact is still very, very present here in in this region and um, I am actually very I feel optimistic about the future because I think the next generation have a more they have a more nuanced understanding about things and they have a less likely reactionary we need to go to war this person is bad Mm, this is good I think that there's more understanding now around these more complex issues that's my hope and that's my optimism speaking and i see that more in the new generation than i did in older generations when the only re- solution to conflict was war mm. whereas i feel like maybe the next generation will have other solutions as well i hope that'll be the case i mean yeah like for for us like uh, we have been uh, exposed to all these different conflicts that happened like whether currently or in the past yeah. and like it all gives into your perspective about like how <coughs> do you think all of these conflicts would end and like the most reoccurring pattern is like uh, 
most of the people are going to die and like politicians are going to uh, I don't know make a deal or something and yeah. then it's all going to be forgotten about and like the people are the ones who are going to get affected by this yeah. the most so why are we keep getting into these conflicts where we know that we are the only ones that are going to uh, lose by then yeah like mm-hmm. there is uh, like you can win but like at what cost at what as cost yeah, yeah as they say so uh, i think that adds to the whole new generation's approach yeah. to okay let's try to to find a solution to find uh, something to come back to combat conflict rather than with conflict itself yeah and like i think also like having this exposure and like uh, this insight about what's going on around the world and even though that it adds so much to like the external pressures on you because yeah. like you, you see all of these people doing all this crazy kind of stuff where you are still going to classes and yeah. like it's, it's like uh, what you are doing seems so insignificant to what's happening in yeah. the world but like it also added to your perspective that uh, this is something that's reoccurring that it's happening in multiple places around the world and it's mostly going to end by a deal or something like that and like only the people who are in the middle of this they are going to get affected by it the most yeah <coughs> So that I think adds to the approach, but like uh, regionally speaking, like as a country that has been through so much conflict and so much uh, terrorism and so much, um, like my mom always talks about like how you can pick any random person that you can see on the street and they would tell you horrendous stories about like what happened to them in the past like 10, 20, 30 years. So it, all of this has affected us and like it affected the older generation and like the newer generation. So I don't know like how as a country in the midst of all that is trying to rebuild itself and like create something better. I I don't want to sound cliche, but yeah. it is education. Yeah. Right? Education is really important. And I think one one way to rebuild any type of nation or a group or a system is through through education if you don't have people who have the capacity to learn and understand and really you're going to be repeating the same mistakes you know mm. but unfortunately what i see now is that the people in power either don't recognize this or recognize it and are using it as a weapon because Mm. our education has not really improved as much as other um, sectors in our government has. Yes. And um, it's falling very much behind. And in the Kurdish region, particularly the public schools are very behind. Mm. Um, And at this point, if you can afford it, people just send their children to private school. And it used to not be like that a few decades ago. It was more or less you send them to public school if you are very wealthy you send them to private school so that has completely created an inequality here and that i think is going to create division and division is usually what create what leads to conflict and i don't know if this is something that they're doing consciously or unconsciously but it is happening right now and unfortunately if this continues then we will see more division and you know, consequent, consequently, more conflict. But I'm hoping with the access that people have nowadays to information, that that is kind of mitigated in a way, because mm-hmm. now children have so much access to information, YouTube, the Which outside is really world. Bad, I think. It is bad, but I yeah. mean, you know, it can also serve as something that is good because it opens people's eyes up to um, more of the world. You know, mm-hmm. sometimes. Um, if we're just shown one perspective, one narrative, that's what we stick with. But once we're exposed to more, we're, our mind opens up to more. So I'm hoping that in a way, even if there's a systemic lack of education, that due to just the access infor- of information, people who are um, 
curious and want to learn have the ability to do so. Yeah. So education is a huge aspect of it. Huge, I think. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And what like, do you think? <laughs> uh, I don't know. I think, of course, like education plays a huge role into things. But like education has also been one of the tools that has been weaponized by yeah. like uh, when like countries they were at war, like most of the time they would send students to the like front uh, uh, battlefields and like the stuff like that. So schools also like play a huge role in like uh publicizing ideologies or like uh i don't know making more poli- like making s- specific parties or like ideas more encouraged or like trying to push some things o- onto the uh the students yeah and uh, i don't know it seems to be that students like I was watching something the other day about like how students in the past, especially like college students, were a very like feared entity with societies because like they were the one holding uh, the most uh, like up to date information and where they were the ones who are uh, p- practicing it and most of the revolutions and like the big changes yeah. that happened started from college students but now as a senior college student I don't think that I think like students nowadays are like so into like uh, I guess just trying to submit their assignments yeah there's more distraction (coughs) yeah of course yeah and there's also less life and death Mm. in a way like how come I mean I think now there's a less um, immediate threat to the lives of people in Iraq Mm. Whereas before there was an active force that was yeah. threatening their lives and therefore they had to have some type of um, movement to combat that. So yeah. I think now we don't have that. It's not as immediate. Therefore, we have less urgency. Yeah. But in any case, I think in the future, if anything were to happen, it typically will happen with university students because they have the most to give and the least to lose you know yeah that's a really good point like but most of the time like college students are the ones with uh, very little responsibility yeah like there are hopefully like you you have like some uh, minimum wage to get by so you are not highly fixated on like getting that income or like uh, providing for your family and stuff like that but yeah it seems to be they are the most educated with the least responsibility that's a very good way to put it also address the division within the education system and I think it's a really big issue that we are going through because like you are either not affording like private schools and like you are getting shitty education or like you are uh, paying and like you are getting excellent education and like you are having this like unfair advantage yeah compared to people who don't have the resources to to take the same education that you've been through so uh, i don't know how to fix that <laughs> since education is a very yeah i mean it's uh, one thing, thing that aos is doing is the scholarships kind of, no? yeah the scholarship sponsorships mm. but it is also perpetuating the same system any type of private education yeah leads to that you know um, a lot of, not a lot, but some countries don't have any form of private education and everything is public and because education should not be bought, it's open for everyone. Yeah. Um, so that's one way you can, you know. Look at it. Yeah, yeah it's instead of having the option like for, for regulations to be so that you don't have any private education, that everything is public education because it it is a human right and if it's a human right then why should there be a price tag on it i think it's also like about the quality of the education like if uh, like unfortunately like most of the public like sector like whether it comes to education or like hospitals or any kind of like facility it seems to be that the private ones are the be- providing better services course, and better yeah. options and it's really, it's like, it's good to see like good services, but it's also like, you're gonna think about like, what if people cannot afford that? So 
what's your alternative and like the alternative in most scenarios is like it's a pretty bad one yeah so i don't know like i think people should try to look into trying to minimize this gap between having these very ex- exquisite services provided by public uh, p- sorry private whether universities or like hospitals or any kind of that and t- try to improve the ones that are public because a lot of people cannot afford yeah. that kind of thing yeah i mean it's about putting money into the public sector rather than separating it and creating a new sector yeah but like funnily enough like if if you're gonna talk to students like most of them want to work for the private sector yeah because that's where the money is this <laughs> money is that's where you get salaries yeah. and that's yeah. where your work shows the public sector unfortunately has become a joke at this point yeah yeah so i don't know like it's also one of the issues that i think like as you talked about yeah it's, <laughs> it's adding more into the division and like the conflicts and everything is the quality of the education that you have yeah so uh any advice that you have to future generation students on how to i don't know get by <laughs> in the midst of uh, this global conflict and everything honestly i don't even know yeah um yeah i i mean you heard it <laughs> folks like they don't know it all <laughs> yeah even yeah. even your instructors don't know um i think just focus on what's important like you what's important is you surviving you having a good quality of life and you having your community around you yeah and you enjoying the life that you have and i think those things are really important and if you just focus on those things and um cultivate that in your life then that's one way to kind of shut off yeah the that, that, reality of the world yeah um and just harm no one and be of no harm to others either you know yeah i think that also plays a role in that that you at least can trust yourself yeah of not being a force of evil the exactly yeah. yeah i mean i i know that some people that they have a biological um issue with that but m- typically we don't and i i think mm. self-interest is important um to some extent but when it starts hurting other people then it's really not worth it so just focus on what's important your survival is important your family is important your loved ones are important you having the basic needs such as shelter food education water these things are important so we just focus on creating that access for yourself and for others around you good so <laughs> nothing big just <laughs> doing that <Yeah. laughs> changing the world <laughs> amazing yeah <laughs> uh, you you took your like masters in harvard yes yeah and like you finished your bachelor degree here at aos true so how different it is because like this is arguably an american education system mm. how different it is from an actual american university from an actual american um i was here for undergrad and then i did masters there so i don't i can't speak for the undergrad program there mm. because it's i'm i'm assuming a bit different um so i can't compare the four year program with the four year program here however there are similarities and there are differences like anything else um one difference is obviously that that is that harvard is a huge institution and they have a lot of access yeah. to resources people knowledge they just the word access is what i would say defines okay. a, a place like harvard yeah. um if you want the leading scientist on i don't even know like a specific topic you can get them to go to harvard mm. give a talk you can likely persuade them to come and become an instructor so it's a place where the elite the t- top of the top the 1% whatever they are there and as a student you have access to that which is incredible but also obviously very um overwhelming yeah. right but one thing that you have at a place like AYS is you might not have access but you have community and the community especially if you're someone who lives here and who wants to continue living in Iraq and even in the Middle East this community ends up being very important for you because the people that you graduate with the people who went to AYS um the alumni the students 
you have a connection to all of them and mm. there's whatever change you want to make in this country you can do it with these people because yeah. you you can trust them and you can you understand um what their educational background is so one thing i think AYS has is community and i think i value that a lot yeah. i think it's really important for students to have um a good relationship with their instructors i think it's vice versa good in- instructors having a good relationship with their students um there's it's a very beneficial relationship and one thing that at a place like that you have less access to is is that type of relationship Community. building mm-hmm. yeah you don't mm-hmm. have as much access to what do you think that like is, uh, people there are more like closed off and more it's just the uh, amount of people that are there mm. there's just too many you get lost you know um at AYS in your classes you're what 25 yes you know yeah. um in a school like that typically classes are not very large but sometimes you can even be 150 in a class so you know it's, it's more much, yeah. yeah and the instructor might be you know doing so much research, research on the side doing um publicity doing a book review doing, doing another book or no, they just have too much to going on to actually give you one on one one on one um time for growth and yeah. you know advice which is again something that AYS has yeah and i think we sometimes overlook that benefit um and we value the access more which again is very important however especially if you choose to be in a country like this it's really useful for you to have this network of people around you and who know you and who trust you and because a lot of things here are done with trust yeah right so either good or bad but like, either yeah. good or bad that's one of the ways that we get things done mm. and that's one thing that AUIS i think provides this community yeah yeah i think that's a really good point about like how the different scale of like the amount of people who are getting into the actual class itself affect your like uh learning experience because yeah and in situations where like the classroom is cause like a lot of students it's going to result in less ed- like education for you yeah because you're going to be just lost in in all of all of this but like here most of the cases you can have some good one on one learning experiences with like your instructors and i think that's pretty valuable and pretty necessary and yeah. i've heard from like students who are also like going to like public universities down in the south like this is also an issue it's not only about the uh large of the uh, like how uh, the amount of the students in the classroom but like how instructors have like this negative attitude toward mm. like how they address students or like how they would uh, treat them in a way that's not very i don't know professional or uh, looking down on them yeah. per se so that's also plays a huge ro- role into where AOS comes in like i don't th- i think most of the instructors here are really glad to help students like yeah. that's why office hours are it's a big part of our yeah, job yeah p- it's a it's pretty emphasized here pretty very much, much emphasized so. in yeah. this university and yeah. i think it's one of the huge perks about this place yeah. where like people can uh, like whatever you have that you haven't fully comprehended or like fully understood you can just go to an instructor and like try to get uh, to the bottom of this and like yeah uh, and you also it. at the same time again if your goal is to be here in this region you do have really great access to people here as well because yeah. your instructors are typically working within the region they have their own contacts they do their own research so you have access but on a much la- smaller scale and it's more regional mm. which might be even more useful for you you know so again i always encourage students when you're here at AUIS make sure that you build good relationships especially with one or two instructors that can help you and become your mentors because those are going to be lifelong relationships that is professional relationships that will inevitably um put you where to where you need to be or where you want to go yeah like networking 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 yes it's pretty but i think pretty. again i have a 
I have an issue with the word networking. I think it's building relationships mm. because I think there's a difference between networking and just getting someone's number and then reaching out to them. But actually building relationships take time. Mm. And so I have, I don't know, maybe so far I've had 200, 300 students and they all have access to my email, right? Yeah. But I will probably only write recommendation letters for people that I actually know and I've had a a relationship with and I if someone else comes to me and they ask for a, about a recommendation I'm not going to say no but I wouldn't have anything to say about them you yeah. know it'll, it'll be very generic so it is that you know that relationship that you yeah, that's that's a really interesting <coughs> way to look at it that's not only having their like contact information but yeah. it's actually like uh, building on that connection that you have so th- it's, it's fosters into something exactly uh, to the future and I think that's a really interesting way to look at it. Yeah. Uh, so the access with Harvard and uh, the personal growth here, yeah. what else? I mean, there are so many differences. Um, for me, it was that I am from Sully. I lived with family there. I lived alone. Mm. Um, and I got to meet a lot of different people, which is another huge benefit of studying abroad is you meet so many different people from many different nationalities yeah um i met my roommates were one one of the girls she was dutch and another was korean Mm. and i learned so much about both cultures majority of my friends were pakistanis um I just it just opens up your perspective into the diversity of the world. Yeah. And again, that's not something we can get at AYS. AYS pretty diverse for the region, but overall globally it's not. Mm-hmm. But with with an institution like Harvard or any of the ones abroad, um, international student body is really important. And the program that I went to had a huge emphasis on that. So you, I met so many people from all around the world and. Again, in the future, if I ever want to travel to that country, I have their contact and I can reach out to them and they can be local guys. Yeah. They can help you in different ways. And um, that's, yeah, that's something that you can't really get at AYS okay. to the same extent. How, like, living abroad, uh, was that a huge challenge? Yes, it was for me because it was my first time being away from family. Mm. I think people who live in the dorms here are very courageous to go and live on their own from such a young age, you know, like yourself. Yes. Um, But I was very much comfortable here in Sully and I had the same group of friends that I did in high school. Like I, it was, I was very... Graduated to to college and then... We all stayed together and then I was kind of forced to make new friends and mm. I'd never made new friends. I probably hadn't made a new friend since middle school. Like it just, we were so close knit and just having to be on my own, like having to actually physically be on my own yeah. and realizing that I don't have a person to call if I need something is really scary, but also empowering. Um, so it took me some time to really get used to it. But once I did, I that experience made me feel like I can move and live anywhere in the world. I can adapt to any situation. Yeah. So it was incredibly valuable. However, it was very challenging. I do not want to downplay the challenging part. Yeah. Yeah. You also like seems to have a huge interest in food and poetry. <laughs> food, mostly, yeah. yeah. So how how did that start? Where? Where did that oh, stem from? food. Okay. So you are also a foodie, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. How did your food, love for food, start? Uh, coming back from school, uh, like especially during the winter days and having that hot plate of stew and rice yeah. that your mom gives you <laughs> where like the steam is coming yeah. out of the plate and you are tired, like you, you have been uh, at school since the morning and now it's... 2 p.m. or something like yeah. this but like that one plate it's it restores everything yeah it's like, nourishing yeah it brings balance to the world i think so yeah i think it started from there so did you are you just someone who eats food or do you also cook food i mean as a college student who's graduating next semester mm. i try my best yeah. to uh, to investigate my culinary skills <laughs> yeah but most 
of the time, I just enjoy eating food. You just enjoy eating yeah. food. Okay. I mean, we have to cook to survive yeah. sometimes. But, but uh, do you get enjoyment out of cooking the process? Uh, sometimes. Yeah. But n- like. You if, prefer for it to be. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. If, yeah. Uh, if, if you're tired and like you're going through stuff, uh, most of the time I don't find myself like escaping yeah through cooking uh, it's, it's not there yet and i think a part of it is like we don't really have like good stoves and like so good i hear yeah in the, in the dorms and yeah. the dorms so we basically rely on our air fryers a lot Ooh, yeah. yeah uh but like we also like in the good old days this semester before like assignments were like this we work uh, like uh, we were meal prepping basically yeah. for the entire week but like I, I i can't do it here but it's not as good as like if you actually have an oven and like definitely yeah some actual good stove too yeah so yeah we would cook for an entire week and then we just reheat it but now it's either at the cafeteria or like uh, uh, reheating stuff in the air fryer yeah. so that's my experience with like the cooking aspect but like enjoying eating it's <laughs> like, like that <laughs> that's a whole other yeah that's a uh, whole yeah, other yeah. thing like uh do you know abc the the buffet yeah but i haven't been to the one in Sulay. i've only been to the one in edb yeah, yeah so this weekend we we went on so like we finished last day of classes yeah. we have a bit of money left yeah. before we are <laughs> declaring bankruptcy. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, so we decided to go to, to Arbil and like the whole purpose of that trip is to relax and eat. Of course. Yeah. So so we went on a two hours expedition <laughs> into uh, the uh, culinary exquisites of the of the world. Yeah. And uh, we w- we made uh, like the money that we paid <laughs> like <laughs> we, we we got a huge uh, turn on that. We, we were basically eating for two hours. Of course. Yeah, we, we reached the human uh, limit when it comes to how much <laughs> food you can eat in two hours. And like this, that, uh, the, the, like the place I'm talking about, ABC and like uh, yeah. Arbil, it's really a great place to explore that because... To explore your passion. Yeah, yeah. because like, uh, and like, I learned that from Riva, like you, you start where like, I don't know, like, uh, w- do you enjoy steaks and like ribs and this kind of stuff or no. it's not your cup of tea? Yeah. Okay, so we start from that because mm-hmm. like, it's the Protein. most, ex- yeah, yeah, it's the most expensive one. <laughs> like we can <laughs> get like uh, some stew and yeah. rice every day, but like you can eat how mu- however how much you want of steaks every True. day that's a very yeah. good way to think about so it so we start from there and then we like so Italian. there's a whole like yeah yeah plan. It's, yeah uh, start from there <laughs> move to the italian uh, <laughs> like pastas and stuff load up on some carbs and then <laughs> go back to seafood and it, it's an amazing two hour uh, like experience that I would recommend to everyone. Maybe you should have it right ri- documented so that people can go there and yeah, I would recommend. Yeah, I would recommend yeah. start with the steaks if you are like uh, if you enjoy uh, your protein. Start from there and then uh, go as you see fit. But start from there <laughs> because like yeah, uh, when you start, you don't want to fill up with carbs course, so much because you're gonna get filled and you yeah. have two hours. Do you only have two hours? Yeah, yeah. that's the unfortunate aspect of it. I haven't been there in s- like a several, several. Uh, yeah, several years. Several years. Yeah. But um, last time I was there, their Arabic, Iraqi, and Kurdish, like their Middle Eastern food, was really good. Yeah, it is. But their other cuisines were not great, so maybe they have improved since then yeah for us it, like everything was like uh, top notch uh, until it came to the dessert mm. like the dessert didn't feel like it was fresh it wasn't yeah that Did new, they have the ice cream machines yes okay it's amazing yeah, <laughs> yeah I mean, uh, you can have as much ice cream you want <laughs> like i can show you a picture like we took picture of every like uh, meal that we went through and uh, <laughs> at this point i think we have an album by now and yeah. so when you're hungry in the dorms you're just yeah, looking at you're it just looking right? at it okay <laughs> i i was uh, having the most amount of food a few days ago so <laughs> that would get me covered yeah. For <laughs> yeah it's like stored energy yeah so we really enjoy that and then like after that we we just went on walking 
because uh, you have to, yeah, yeah we have to and yeah, then we slept <laughs> and then you slept that's yeah. that sounds like an ideal day for me yeah yeah i i love food i've um i've i grew up in a family who loves food so i grew up both enjoying eating it but also enjoying the process of cooking it mm-hmm. um i grew up in my grandma's house and my grandparents house and so i would sit down with my grandmother and she would teach me how to do a lot of the things so when i cook people don't expect that my food would taste like a grandmother's food yeah. but it does because that's how i learned how to cook they have this aspect of warmth into the food i yeah. don't know like it's it's not the measurement like you can see like recipes online they yeah, don't follow they, they don't follow recipes yeah, reci- i don't follow recipes either yeah. and i think that's one of the things that's one of the reasons i really enjoy cooking is because i don't follow recipes yeah. i i understand the basics and through that i can create my own yeah. thing um But yeah, I try to I've been trying to kind of document the types of um food that my grandmother makes and I'm like, "Can you tell me how much this is?" And she's like, "No, no, just you just take your hand and you yeah. put it. And I'm like, "What do you mean by that?" And she's like, "No, no, no." Like I remember she was cooking turkey and they my family says she cooks the best turkey and yeah. there's honestly no kind of art to it. It's just they boil it. Yeah. But then she would be like she put her finger on the turkey and she'd say, "Now, now it's good." And I'm like, how how do you know like can you describe to me what good is like what does the turkey need to be and she's like i don't know you just touch it and it should feel good and i'm like what do you mean by that i don't know what that means can you please tell me yeah. and she just had no like it was just more like natural to her you know yeah. it was innate it wasn't something that she could explain and i just love that and i like that's one of my favorite parts of cooking is just cooking without any recipes just yeah. cooking to like you know putting in whatever you you feel like it uh, needs in that moment yeah i think that like this uh, high fixation on recipes is more like a nuanced approach to cooking yeah <coughs> i don't think like previous generations had any of that like you, you might need it for like pretty complicated baking yeah. recipes or stuff like that but i think the, the sorry to cut you, cut you off but the previous generations had intergenerational homes which mm. meant that you grew the recipes up with yeah, transfer orally uh, yeah. whereas people nowadays they have separate homes so therefore they need to rely on some type of document yeah. to I mean, get that's, their food that's a good point yeah. yeah but other in you know older generations they just all grew up together and learn how to cook together and that's why it, it it's not a recipe to them it's just mm. like this feels like this is the right amount and that's that's that yeah it's it's anic mesonic it's like uh, you 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 balance it with like you 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 are yeah, yeah, yeah. and, and that's it and yeah. most of the time it turns out pretty good yeah it does i mean um when i started kurdish foodie a lot of people messaged me saying this tastes like my mother's or my grandmother's yeah and they're saying oh you, your recipes stay really true to the form and that's just it like i don't really want to make any changes it's yeah. already been tried and tested like no deconstructed uh, I do sometimes yeah. for the fun of it but the basics I keep basic you know and a lot of the feedback that I got was around this tastes so similar to what my mother my grandmother um they've you know moved away they really miss their mother's food yeah they use those recipes and again it's very basic um recipes and I have still people call- messaging me now saying that they rely on the page pretty pretty frequently even yeah. now even though it's been inactive for a few years now it's a little unfortunate by the yeah. way yeah <laughs> it's I, you see the students they won't let me yeah <laughs> i'm so kidding the it's public stu- yeah, public yeah my <laughs> public speaking students that i've only been teaching this semester yeah. and the, the page has been inactive yeah. for three years um but it takes a lot of time that's why like yeah, yeah i yeah. i just don't have the time to um, dedicate to that and i also i think we talked about that last time but i just don't want to be a public facing yeah. figure and i think that is where that leads to usually what do you think about this new notion about uh, like how the plate is presented rather than the qu- quantity of the food Oh, so you mean like high-end restaurants when yeah, they do that? Yeah, basically. I think it's a form of art. Yeah. So I think when you go to a restaurant like that, that is the expectation. You're there to experience a different side of the culinary world. It There's a reason why it's called culinary arts, mm. right? Um, you go to Sara, you get your rice, you get your stew, you get your meat, and you know what it is, and it's great, and it tastes amazing, right? But you go to like a by a three michelin star restaurant that's not what you're going to get you're mm. going to get it's going to be a journey they're going to start everything is going to be so well thought out you're going to start with something very small and then 
you know, it's it takes you through this journey of flavors. And that is just what that is. You know, it's yeah. two different things. Um, if you go into a Michelin experience expecting like hearty food, that's not what you're no, gonna that's get, not no. what you're going to get. And would you actually get like full after? It depends. Yeah. I mean, I have done a few Michelin stars um, so far and at all of them, I get really full by the end because there are multiple courses. So if you follow their set menu, one one of the ones, my favorite restaurant in the world so far that I've been to, mm. um, I'm going to shout it out. It's called Yann. It's in Nice, um, in Where? France. In France? Yeah, okay. Nice, France, called Yann. It's a... Y-A-N? J-A-N. J-A-N, okay. Yeah. He's a South African chef. Yeah. Incredible food. It was 11 courses. And they were all tiny. And we okay. thought we were going to, me and my friend, we went together. We thought we were going to not be full because we hadn't eaten anything the entire day. So we um, kept eating bread, banana, butter, and bread that they had provided. Yeah. And by the sixth course, we were so full, we didn't know how to finish the other courses. Yeah. Like we were, because it's a lot. And the thing with food is your stomach, if you continue eating and you don't have a stop, then you won't get that response that you know you're full yeah so because you're t- eating in small intervals you you enjoy yeah. it and your stomach understands that yeah. you, you are eating therefore you don't need more yeah so it's it's a different way to think about it but w- once you mentioned that it's 11 courses then <laughs> uh, i'm, I'm the <laughs> yeah 11 courses and they're all like tiny but they're yeah. s- they just i've been to uh, i've been to another michelin star restaurant in malaysia and yeah that one was also 11 courses, but I did not enjoy the food. Mm. But I also appreciate the art- artistic um, aspect, of, aspect it. of it. Yeah, because the things that the the chef was doing with ingredients and food was like art. It was chemistry. They were like really playing with the material. Yeah. But the food itself was hit and miss. Some of it was good. Some of it was not good. But it was still very interesting. Where so, have you? Where do you think like? the country with the most delicious food i don't know but i would love to one of the places i really want to go to is um thailand and singapore yeah singapore has one of it has a really high rate of michelin stars and it also has a lot of um very cheap ones so that means that you can get like i think it's in singapore where you can get noodles for two dollars and it's Michelin star like isn't it's mm. been inspected yeah although I know there are issues around with the rating and with like the rating and like how it's um, biased towards specific regions of the world and yeah like we don't have a lot of them in the Middle East which I completely understand but um, that area I would love to because they just have such a Southeast Asia ha- they just have such incredible flavors um, so that would be where I would love to kind of explore just yeah. the just a journey through the street food nothing else yeah it'd be incredible don't you think that like on a day-to-day basis our uh, food options here in this country are enough what do you mean by that <laughs> so like i don't know because like i think our like the options that we have like uh, the local dishes yeah. that we provide i think they are pretty sufficient to they are definitely sufficient yeah. i mean Again, if it's about nourishment, then they do nourish you, yeah. right? And they are typically very nutritional as well. We have our carbs, we have our protein, we have our fiber with the vegetables, we have our uh, probiotics with the um, anba or the tishyat. Yeah. So we have a lot of different, um, uh, yeah. But the thing is, the flavor profile is pretty consistent like it doesn't change much which is good because sometimes in everyday life you don't really want that many surprises and a lot of people they just like to eat one thing over and over again i'm one of those people when i once i like something i just want to eat that for yeah a period of time so i think we have great options but i also think you know there's a lot more in the world yeah (laughs) i think it's it's a really good way to look at it uh what's your favorite food (laughs) ABC, <laughs> <laughs> just because there's everything there. Yeah, uh, I don't know. I uh, like as you talked about. Like uh, our family is really also like yeah. we really appreciate our like lunch and dinner. Yeah, we 
it's like basically where everyone meets up and yeah. this is what I miss the most while being here yeah it's like this sense of like uh, preparing everything like uh, putting the table together yeah. and then like uh, everyone sitting there like talking enjoying the food and then what comes afterwards so uh, this is like my entire life yeah yeah <coughs> so it's, it's really sad to to miss it for a couple of months every year but we have to do this <laughs> but uh, yeah i mean like i don't know like being from the south we we really appreciate fish so you so really good fish. yeah so uh, i really enjoy the fish and like w- like we grill at our home like my, my dad like every <coughs> every weekend like he either is going to prepare for us like either chicken uh, or fish or we're gonna do some barbecue and go there yeah. at night with steaks and this kind of stuff so uh, anything that comes when when i go back home it's pretty good but i would have to say that <coughs> uh i think if we had like a pretty popular chef coming to our house i would ask my mom to make him um, the what is it called Qarnabit? was mm. it in, Engli- in english cauliflower yeah cauliflower mm. so she makes this cauliflower stew i love cauliflower yeah, yeah. and like i don't know it's like when you taste cauliflower on itself like it's a pl- like it's very bland yeah, yeah. It's pl- it doesn't taste like anything yeah but like she makes it in a way and like she, at the end like she pops it into the oven and where like the the top of it gets crispy yeah i think it's one of the most like special things that i've tasted and like as i said winter days coming back yeah. from school like that dish uh, it's something else. I'm very sorry to bring this up for you right now yeah, during it's, it's, finals. It's really <laughs> I know it's a very tough time. <laughs> it's pretty sad. Like I was just yeah. looking with her and she's <laughs> saying, yeah, I'm preparing food where you uh, guys come in. I know like you are all going to come in here pale faced. Oh. Like <laughs> <laughs> but like, yeah, this is uh, one of the things that we miss. But yeah, the cauliflower stew, it's, it's really special. That sounds really good. Yeah, because like you can have good steaks and <clears throat> like you can have good chicken or fish at restaurants but like this one specific stew I haven't seen it being this well made anywhere it's your mom's specialty yeah it's my mom's specialty that's great so ending with our (coughs) long lasting tradition what's your favorite movie and TV show okay so movie we talked about that as again I don't want to refer too much to the last episode but um, which is lost in the which is lost Yeah. yeah But I don't really watch movies that much. Yeah. Um, but I l- watch TV shows. I watch any comedy that you can think of. I've watched it most likely. Yeah. Um, I don't really watch things that make me sad or upset. I only watch things that make me happy or laugh or, you know, um, where I can turn off my brain. So my favorite comedies are... Arrested Development, it's mm. one that I really like, the first two seasons especially. It's one of the best comedies. Um, I love Succession. Unfortunately, it ended. It's a really good show. Yeah. Um, I I just, yeah, any any comedy you tell me, I've probably watched it and I love it. You're talking about like things that only brings you joy, but like Succession has some really dark aspects to it. I know, it. but it's like about really rich people. So you don't care, huh? <laughs> I don't care. Yeah, I think that's why it got like really popular yeah. because like you don't really feel s- sorry for these people. No. Like y- y- you are going out in jets and like uh, getting on these like very expensive cars. Like yeah. your issues don't matter to Your issues much. are so like what I loved about Succession was just the backdrop was always this incredibly fancy resort house yeah. location and these people were like so busy about um, who's taking who's over taking the company taking over the company like you have access and you have so much wealth just enjoy it yeah. and this is what they're doing with their time so it is like it's obviously a very interesting commentary into family and you know relationships I and power th- but yeah. but just overall when you think about it that way yeah you talked about yeah. like appreciating that i think this is one of the reasons that like 
Logan, the father, like despises his children. Of course, like, yeah. Because like they don't appreciate that. But like the thing is, like they they've learned that from him. Like he's not appreciating that. He's not appreciating it yeah, at all. Yeah, like yeah. Uh, and he's not letting them appreciate it either. He's, yeah. He's resentful that they have. B- they're born with this privilege and he wasn't and he had mm. to make him make himself into this person and his children. so he's neither like appreciating it or letting them appreciate it no he's it. not yeah. no yeah he's he's putting an impossible task on them which is i think the entire kind of premise of succession which is that there's no winner here because yeah. th- it's impossible for them to win logan's approval yes um, because he himself resents them so much, he's not going to. Th- yeah. What what he wants is unrealistic because they cannot be self-made because they are born with this privilege. Mm. So it's it's just an incredible show. It's so good. Yeah, it's amazing. I'd like. Yeah. Uh, Who's your favorite character? Who's my? That's a very good question. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Romulus is pretty. Romulus uh, is really yeah, good. He's yeah, he's hilarious, Yanni. He's really. I good. don't know, like a lot of them are really interesting. Like you, you, you can make an argument for Tom, how he's like a regular human. Yeah. And how he uh, interacts with these people. Same argument can be made for Greg, as well. Yeah. Like uh, the, he's like, if, uh, I've seen some videos about like how, uh, like Tom and Greg are like, are the public's reaction to the Roy family. Yeah. So there can be an argument made for that. I don't know. They like each character has something that's unique about it and like picking one, I don't know. Kendall is really sad. Kendall is incredible. <laughs> yeah. Kendall is really sad. He's so uh, sad. Yeah. He's the eldest boy. From the second be- that's <laughs> one of the issues like he he is the eldest boy, but like there is also Connor who's forgotten, and like everyone forgets. <laughs> <laughs> oh it's God. it's so like it's so funny and like it's such a good show. Yeah, I really uh, recommend it. Yeah, I think amazing. the first season is like a bit slow. So I don't think so. Some it, people say that, but I think you just stick with it. Like yeah. it's a really good show. S- season one, like uh, episode six, like it's called Which Side Are You On? Uh, I think after that episode, if you're not hooked with the, with the yeah. show, like, there is something wrong <laughs> with you. Yeah. Because, like, it's amazing. Cause, like, even when you get back and, like, read the the history of the song that they've chosen for, like, it's it's called Which Side Are You On? Mm. It's about, like, uh, this, like, union worker who was, like, really uh, enthusiastic about, like, the union and, like, their rights. And he used to make these concerts and like he would only uh, keep the money that he needed to keep him going throughout the year and the, the and the rest of the money is all going back to the to the union and like it's used on corporations yeah. and like uh, companies that are so far away so far from away, yeah and it's uh, like an ac- iconic song at this yeah. point yeah so it's amazing it's the songs Billy Jewel always makes its appearance like with honesty and like it's amazing yeah it's, yeah. A, it's a masterpiece I yeah. it's probably one of the best shows in the last few years that I can think of yeah I think that as well when it comes to the small screen it's it's definitely succession uh, I think we are up any final remarks for students <laughs> Study for your exams. <laughs> study for your exams. Okay. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Badr, for having me again. Uh, we've taken so much of your time by no. now. I hope that electricity. This electric- is a pleasure. Yeah, I hope that electricity doesn't cut off now, I and hope we so. can <laughs> conclude this in peace. Uh, thank you, everyone, for listening. This has been an amazing episode. Thank you so thank much. Thank you so much, Badr. Uh, have a good day. Stay safe and bye bye. Bye bye.